My name is Lori Hart. I'm Professor of Anthropology and Global Studies. I'm the Director of the Center for European and Russian Studies here. I want to welcome you all to our first Zoom talk for the Center for, uh, for this spring uh, 2020. So wonderful that many of you, so many of you could join us. Um, and as many others have observed this spring, I'm sure you've heard this before, although we're deprived of the joys of in-person contact, we're able to expend, extend our offerings to others who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend. So welcome to our far-flung attendees and um, please be sure that you're welcome to join us for other, other events as we go forward. I'm absolutely thrilled that we have Katrina uh, Piotrowski joining us today as our opening talk. I wanted to let you know that on Thursday, um, uh, um, May 28th at 2 p.m. we'll have our second lecture for the spring. Maite Zubiaure talking, uh, giving a, a talk um, called Talking Trash, the Cultural Uses of Waste. So you can follow the center on Facebook or also join our email list through Facebook or the center website for future events. Okay, I wanna mention a couple of logistical matters before we start, this being Zoom. Uh, we are recording this meeting. If um, It's really nice to see your faces, but if you don't want to be seen in the recording, you are free to mute your video. In any case, please do uh, keep your audio muted. Um, at the end of the lecture, we will take questions and we're gonna use the chat function to do that. I will mention this again at the end. Most of you are probably familiar with it, but that way we can efficiently use our time to ask a few questions of Katerina at the end. So with that, let me introduce Katerina briefly. She is Associate Professor in the Department of Comparative Literature at Harvard University, where she joined the faculty in 2013 after completing her PhD in comparative literature at NYU and a DPhil in the Romance Studies Department at Vienna University. Uh, her teaching and research focus, as you'll, you'll hear uh, today, is on cartography, as well as translation studies, gender studies, opera and theater, as well as theories of world cinema. Working in 10 linguistic traditions, <laughs> Pretty impressive. Her research and teaching is extraordinarily dis interdisciplinary in nature, um, both centering on canonical texts and as well untranslated and less studied authors. So her book about which she will be talking today, her recent book, um, Cartographic Humanism, The Making of Early Modern Europe, was published with the University of Chicago Press in 2019. And I'm not going to say anything further about that right now because Katrina will be speaking about it. But let me just briefly mention that she has two other current book projects in the works. One, Hercules, Procreative Poetics and the Rise of the Opera Libretto on the Poetics of the Libretto and the Figure of Hercules is under, uh, under um, uh, current work. And it is an investigation, among other things, of gender politics, performance practices, medical discourses, and the rise of absolutism. Pretty compelling. Uh, project. Um, she also is uh, co-editing a current volume called The Future of Geography, which addresses a set of urgent questions about the future of geography as geography departments are disappearing from several universities across the U.S. while they are emerging and thriving in others, so a consideration of that new landscape. Katrina has had numerous fellowships and grants. I'll just mention a couple of them. The inaugural fellowship at the newly founded Europe Center at the University of Konstanz in Germany, a distinguished junior external fellow at the Stanford Humanities Center, John F. Kogan Junior Faculty Lead Fellowship from Harvest's Davis Center, and on and on. She's also widely published journal articles and book chapters uh, that I won't uh, mention now just for the sake of time. And so with that, let me welcome Katrina Piechotsky to talk to us about her new book. Katrina. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lori, for this very generous introduction. Uh, can you all hear me all right? Yes, okay. Um, and for having me, really. It's an enormous pleasure to be here with you uh, today and to speak about my book, Cartographic Humanism, The Making of Early Modern Europe. 
Before I start, I would like to thank Laure Murat, the former director of CELS, for inviting me to talk about my book even before it was out. Um, I would also like to thank Liana Grancha and Samia Lachan for making this event possible. We're meeting under very different circumstances than initially imagined, not in person, uh, but within the framework of remote communication, which required an entirely different planning. Um, so thank you very much for making this virtual meeting possible. While I'm breaching one of the major principles of Aristotelian rhetoric, namely, know thy audience, I am grateful to be speaking over Zoom, which allows me nevertheless to bring many scholars, colleagues, and friends together in really previously unimaginable ways. Thank you very much to all of you for being here today. I'm delighted to share with you some of my main ideas that I have been developing and thinking about for more or less 10 years and that, that have taken the shape of a monograph, cartographic humanism. Before delving deeper into the questions and topics addressed in the book, which I can only briefly allude to and I hope that we will have a chance to perhaps deepen some of them in the Q&A, let me briefly tell you where I'm coming from and how the idea to write this book first originated. I'm, um, two strands of thinking have really driven my research and they are reflected in the dual title of my book, the definition of early modern Europe on the one hand and cartographic humanism on the other. Now I will retreat uh, into a corner and start my slideshow so bear with me as I will hope to share with you my slides. Uh, can you see them? Do you see the slides? Yes? Yes, we see them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so as to the first pathway, as an early modernist, I have always been struck by the fact that scholars of the Renaissance tend to entertain a relatively narrow understanding of Renaissance Europe often reducing it to a few Western European countries. I myself am Central and Eastern European, although I have studied Romance languages, Italian, French, and to some extent Portuguese. I was born in Poland and migrated with my family at an early age via Norway to Austria, where we were at first political refugees. Those who grew up in or visited Europe before the fall of the Berlin Wall will remember Europe's internal political and cultural divisions protracted by the presence of the Iron Curtain. I do believe that the memory of this time still informs to some extent scholarship on the early modern period today, but also more recent events such as the Yugoslav Wars of the 1990s or Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 show that Europe is not a monolith and that when we say Europe, uh, we um, often have an idea about the continent that tends to smooth out the wrinkles of history. Provincializing Europe, as Deepesh Chakrabarty has long called for, demands, I believe, a return to the question of what early modern Europe actually means and meant in the past. What do we actually have in mind when we say the word Europe? Thinking about Europe requires a critical intervention in the manifold processes which propelled Europe's rise as a continent and an idea. I argue in my book that these processes started in the course of the 15th and 16th centuries. And this leads me to my second pathway that prompted me to write Cartographic Humanism. The hypothesis underlying my book, and hence the title, is that the new imagining of Europe as an increasingly hegemonic and sovereign continent was driven by the rise of a novel humanistic discipline, cartography. Renaissance humanism is commonly thought of as a revival of ancient languages and a renewed interest in disciplines such as philology and the theory and practice of translation. Relatively little attention within the study of humanism is commonly given to questions pertaining to space. Although I need to correct myself instantly and acknowledge the pioneering work that many scholars of literature have undertaken over the past two decades, some even longer, in their study of the role of space, geography, and cartography in early modern literature. 
I want, I want to mention in particular, Franck Lestangon, Tom Conley, Ted Catchy, Walter Mignolo, Ricardo Padron, and Jeff Peters. My work has also been informed by more recent studies. I'm thinking among others of Simon Pinet, Ayesha Ramachandran, Philip Usher, Jörg Dune, Roberta Morosini, and Jakub Niedzwiec. One tends to forget that humanists were spatial thinkers. For instance, Petrarch's first philological endeavors were annotations to Pomponius Mella's geographic work. Petrarch found a copy of Mella's Decorographia, also known as De Situ Orbis, the oldest extant Latin treatise on geography from the first century Common Era, which um, became, together with Ptolemy's second century Common Era geography, one of the most popular and widely consulted works of ancient geography in the Renaissance period. Petrarch, as Ted Catchy has long shown, was immensely interested in geography. He was a spatial thinker who wrote, among others, a fictitious travel narrative to the Holy Land, which showcases Petrarch's profound familiarity with the different cartographic traditions of his time. But also Petrarch's sonnets in the Canzoniere are deeply informed by his remarkable geographic knowledge. Quite frequently, it is Enea Silvio Piccolomini, Pope Pius II, who is considered to be the first humanist to have coined in the middle of the 15th century the Latinate adjective Europeus. The argument often advanced in this context is that the adjective, invented furthermore by a pope, emerged in tandem with the idea of a Christian Europe and with the adjective, and that the adjective European is somehow coextensive with Christianity. Without denying the importance of religion for the formation of Europe as a continent, I shift the focus to geography and cartography, which I believe offers a very complex and heretofore neglected lens upon the emergence of Europe. It was actually the geographer Boccaccio, and this is the title of a volume edited by Roberta Morosini, who one century prior to Piccolomini, was the first to advance in his vernacular commentary on Dante's Divine Comedy, the adjectival neologism Europico. As I disentangle the pair Europe and Christianity, I argue that continental thinking was crystallized in tandem with an unprecedented spatial and cartographic thinking triggered at the beginning of the 15th century by the first major reception in Italy and across Europe of Ptolemy's geography, which became a crucial source for early modern cartographers. Ptolemy became uh, so influential because, among others, the geography was the first work to use longitudinal and latitudinal lines. The coordinate system allowed Ptolemy to locate each place with the help of a longitude and latitude. The visualization of the territory as a grid became in turn the very basis to conceive of territorial boundaries, not as natural borders, but as straight arbitrary lines grounded in the alleged objectivity of, of abstract mathematics. The great disadvantage of straight arbitrary lines is that they are entirely detached from the actual physical territory and the people inhabiting it. The Treaty of Tordesillas, signed between Portugal and Spain in 1494, was the first instance to explicitly refer to these straight lines, called lineas or rayas in the Spanish original, in an attempt at dividing up the Atlantic Ocean into a Spanish and a Portuguese sphere of influence. The text of the treaty clearly states that the line should be drawn without taking into account any landmass it would encounter. In other words, it's not the physical territory and the people inhabiting it that shapes the borderline, but it's the other way around. From the late 15th century on, it's the arbitrary borderline cast on a map that decides upon the formation of communities and territorial boundaries. The Cantino map from 1502 is one of the first maps featuring the linea. From the Treaty of Tordesillas, to the Berlin Congo Conference, which in 1884-85 divided up the African continent by following the logic of the straight line, 
cartography has propelled the arbitrary division of land masses and with it of its inhabitants. Our own 21st century methods of representing space and imagining borders can actually be traced back to those very cartographic models elaborated in the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, of which Ptolemy's coordinate system is an important one. My book adopts a broad comparative lens that brings together literature, cartography, and spatial thinking from Europe's East and West. As you can see from my table of content, I engage with Germany, Poland, France, Italy, and Portugal. The choice of these particular countries might seem arbitrary, and of course it is, but there is also a historical and geographic rationale for my particular choice. In fact, since antiquity, Europe was conceived in symmetrical terms, whereby the West and the East were specular. They were imagined as mirror images, as did the anonymous author of this 11th century Egyptian book of curiosities, the imagining the enclosed Mediterranean Sea symmetrically as an ellipse in which not only Europe and Africa, but also Europe's East and West mirror one another. The ancient geographers frequent use of identical toponyms for Europe's western and eastern border regions and cities further enhance the continent's imagined symmetry. In the work of Strabo, Ptolemy, Plutarch, and Pliny the Elder, the toponym Iberia or Hiberia, for instance, referred at once to the Iberian Peninsula as well as to the region on the Caucasus we now know as Georgia. We can see it here on Sebastian Münster's map of the Caucasus, the reference to Iberia Pars, east of Chalkis. But we also see here on this map, north of Iberia, Alexander's columns. Yet another attempt by ancient geographers and early modern cartographers to delineate Europe's eastern boundaries in symmetry to the pillars of Hercules in Europe's west. In fact, early modern cartographies saw in both the historical Alexander the Great and the mythological figure of Hercules, surveyors of liminal territories staking out continental boundaries in the East and in the West, respectively. In times of territorial expansion and colonization, the symmetry between Europe's East and West was often, of course, politically motivated. The Polish humanist and geographer Maciej Miechowita established an explicit analogy between the king of Poland, Sigismund I, and the king of Portugal, Manuel I. Jehovita thus writes in his treatise on Europe's eastern boundaries, titled Tractatus de Duabus Sarmatis, just as the southern hemisphere, with peoples adjacent to the ocean as far as India, was discovered by the Portuguese king, so the Northern Hemisphere, with its people living closely to the Northern Ocean and oriented toward the East, discovered through the army and warfare of the Polish king, should be opened up and become known to the world. Poland and Portugal stand here in a specular relationship, although Miechowita does not yet divide the hemispheres into East and West, a division only slowly on the rise at the beginning of the 16th century but rather adopts a north-south hemispheric division in the medieval tradition of the zonal or macrobian map, according to which this, the world is divided into five climatic zones. We see here an addition of macrobius with the oikumene, the, the three uh, continent world is known to the ancients, squeezed into the northern hemisphere. And the oikumene is here, as we also see, inverted by mistake. So India is where one would expect the Iberian Peninsula and Europe is in the Far East. Oh well. Ample space is left in the Southern Hemisphere to imagine the potential existence of the Antipodes, or around 1500, the inhabitants of the New World. By the way, when we speak today about the Global South, we actually take up the microbian zonal model which functions as an alternative to continental thinking, as it brings together locales comparable in climes. Continental awareness has an interesting history. In ancient Greece, it emerged not as an opposition between Europe and Asia at first, 
but as a productive tension between the Aegean islands and the surrounding mainland, namely Greece and Asia Minor. In particular, the powerful coastal cities of Athens in Greece and Miletus in Asia Minor, here framed in a beautiful pale orange. In ancient Greece, continent referenced the Eurasian mainland in opposition to the archipelago. The Greek term for mainland, epeiron, literally without boundaries, stood in stark contrast to the boundedness of the island, nesos in Greek. What is of interest is that since the beginnings of pre-Socratic philosophy in Ionian Miletus, geography and philosophy unfolded as twin disciplines. The first Greek philosopher, Alexand Al Anaximander of Miletus, was also the first geographer to represent the inhabited earth on a tablet, thus creating the first map. In Ionian thought, the geographic practice of imagining borderless space and defining entities was enmeshed with the two foundational logical operations which drive philosophical thought, namely to imagine the infinite on the one hand and to define concepts on the other. Early modern humanists mobilized the affinity between cartography and philosophy in new creative ways and with different agendas. None other than Albrecht Dürer powerfully showcased this connection in his allegorical philosophy woodcut, created for Konrad Zeltis's 1502 collection of elegies titled Quattuor Libria Morum Secundum Quattuor Latra Germania. I love this title. Four books of love according to the four sides of Germany. I have to have a sip of water after that. Before delving into this woodcut in greater detail, let me tell you a few words about Celtis's work. Celtis's four books of elegies are probably the earliest and most fascinating cartographic book produced in Germany and probably beyond in the first years of the 16th century. Celtis was the first poet laureate outside of Italy, as well as Dürer's mentor, and his Quattro Libri Amorum is an entirely unprecedented attempt to embed love poetry within a cartographic framework. Each book of elegies written in Neo-Latin hexameters is accompanied by a stylized woodcut, vaguely inspired, very vaguely inspired and creatively inspired by Ptolemy's regional maps of Germany. Each woodcut features not only one side of Germany, but also at the map center, Celtis himself and the company of a regional female love interest. Prefacing Celtis's cartographic elegies, Dürer's woodcut, to which I now return, depicts philosophy as an allegorized female figure. While for Klebanski, Panofsky, and Saxel, the woodcut is still deep, deeply rooted in the medieval tradition of allegorical representation of lady philosophy and the seven liberal arts in the vein of Boethius, we actually realize upon closer examination that the first medallion at, atop the garland, Dura ins that in that uh, top, in, in the top uh, medallion, Dura inserts none other than Ptolemy, suggesting that philosophy and the translatio studi originate with the second common era Roman geographer from Alexandria. In other words, the movement of translatio studi originates not with Greek philosophy, but with cartography and Ptolemy. Plato, Cicero, and Virgil are all anachronistically displaced. Despite having preceded him in time, they appear here as followers of Ptolemy. With Albertus Magnus, the medieval German philosopher and cartographic thinker, the movement of translatio, an itinerary leading from Ptolemy's Egypt to Plato's Greece, to Cicero's and Virgil's Rome, and finally to Germany, comes to a close. The chronological rationale of the movement of translatio is here disrupted and supplanted by a spatial logic. By 1500, cartography has become a strategic intervention, structuring and defining knowledge. 
In Celtics's elegies, spatial and cartographic thinking permeates the very structure of his lines. Gernot Michael Müller, who has studied Celtics's use of dactylic hexameters, has noticed that Celtics carefully arranges words within each line to create a poetic cartography. For instance, Celtis uses dactyls when imagining the rapid movement of rivers. His description of the flow of the Danube to Austria consists only of dactyls. Austria cas aditura plagas sitiumque comantem. But when rivers take on the function of boundaries, Celtis substitutes spondees for dactyls. Solo skerma nas ister sed deserit oras lata peregrinis inducens flumina peris. Celtis's use of the meter is carefully aligned with its geographic function. A dactyl denoting the swiftness of a river is juxtaposed with a spondy used to render the immobility and length of a borderline. Celtis is, of course, not the only poet who aligns meter with cartographic thought and um, who incorporates the specific geographic variations and phenomena of a territory into his lines. Although his four books of elegies are among the very first and finest examples of Renaissance cartographic poetics, Less than 30 years after Celtis, the Veronese physician, geographer, and poet Girolamo Fracastoro inscribed continental thinking in the first extant New World poem titled, you might be surprised, Syphilis, Sive Morbus Gallicus, published in 1530 in Verona. It is in this poem that Fracastoro coined the word syphilis for a relatively new epidemic previously referred to as Morbus Gallicus, or the French disease. We see that national scapegoating in times of pandemics has actually a long history. With the joint developments of the outbreak of the epidemic and the discovery of the new world, the question of the continental connectivity between the oikumene, or the old world, and the new world was sharply on the rise. Fracastoro had a unique way of approaching this question. His pronounced interest in the changing nature of sea levels and the fluctuating elevation of the globe's surface constantly moved and transformed by tides and volcanic eruptions led him to think that land and water were subject to secular changes of elevation. Um, so that an area now dry and raised to mountainous heights may once have been submerged. In his cosmographic homocentrica, Fracastoro writes, and I quote, if a man considers how islands and mountains come into being, he will recognize the time was when they were built out from the sea and that time will be when land now covered by the waves will be inhabited and tilled, and yet again in future time will be again hidden by ocean." End of quote. Fracastor's geologic thought dovetails with Gilles Deleuze's description in the desert island of the oscillation between mountain and island in time. Deleuze writes, I quote, the Ark of Noah sits down on the one place on earth that remains uncovered by water, a circular and sacred place from which the world begins anew. It is an island or a mountain or both at once. The island is a mountain underwater and the mountain an island that is still dry." End of quote. Fracastoro came to imagine that land masses are connected to one another, albeit not always in a visible way. Some connections occur above ground, some underwater. What might appear to the naked eye as two detached land masses, Fracastoro contends, may likely be connected underwater and conversely may become visible above ground when sea levels change. According to Fracastoro, continental continuity and discontinuity can only be comprehensively understood when looked at in a deep and diachronic way. 
when the geological telluric time of continental transformation is included in the evaluation of the ever-shifting contours of land masses. In Fracastoro's Syphilis poem, the undulating movement of the sea, which constantly transforms the surface of the globe, is folded into the very texture of the poem. The noun unda, wave, along with the adverb unde, where, whence, which relates as a homophone to the waves, are carefully inscribed at the beginning, middle, and end of several verses closely grouped together. Fracastoro visualizes for us the movement of the waves inscribed in his lines. And you see, I, I won't read uh, all the lines, but you see here the word unda, wave, uh, creating actually an undulating movement across the lines. As seen in the attention paid to images of undulation created through careful positioning of words, Fracastoro's poetic lines unlock not only an entire theory of changing sea levels, but also new avenues to think the plasticity of a word's literal and metaphorical meaning and metaphoricity itself. Let me unpack this. Fracastoro's poetic inscription of the movement of the waves affords readers an opportunity to see in his meditation upon waves a prime example of the fluidity of his cartographic thought. When read synchronically in a particular moment in time, Fracastoro's expression, plowing the ocean, which appears early on in book two of Syphilis, serves as a metaphor for crossing a body of water. However, when read diachronically across the extended period of secular changes of land and sea, when the ocean's low elevation exposes dry and arable land, the expression plowing the ocean becomes literal. Fracastoro's poetic cartography acknowledges the world's constant motion and transformation and incorporates both geographic and temporal changes as it plots new poetic textures and tarries on the hermeneutics of reading, the intricacies of style, and the limits of representation. Well, it is time for me to end my presentation with a few concluding words. What is Europe? Where are Europe's borders? And what gives Europe a special status? These questions may seem drawn from today's headlines, but they were essential for the Renaissance humanists who form the subject of my book. The question about Europe's borders is as urgent now as it was in the early modern period when the idea of Europe as a continent was first emerging. Europe's rise to an ideologically charged metaphor, an idea that came to stand for a universal and secular vision of the human and for a modern world system has had both extraordinary and devastating consequences on a global scale. During the early modern period, Far from consolidated, the blurred, messy, and confusing contours of Europe were being only negotiated. They demand to be disentangled, in particular given our insufficient and often misleading use of the word Renaissance Europe. My book traces the formation of Europe back from a metaphor and idea to what Roberto Esposito has recently called Europe's bare geographic given, so nudo dato geografico. My book thereby hopes to offer a corrective to our understanding of what we mean when we say Europe in the past, but also with an eye to the present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katerina, for that amazing um, introduction to the uh, complexities of Renaissance geographical and philosophical um, thought. Um, we're going to open the chat room for questions. So uh, for the audience, if you click on the chat function, you'll be able to offer um, questions at the chat function at the bottom of your screen in Zoom if you're not seeing it. Um, Please submit your questions um, in writing um, to, um, to everyone on the um, chat function. Uh, Katrina, I might um, 
start off maybe to ask you to talk a little bit more about the potentialities that you see in the um, messiness that you just described in the formation of the concept of Europe for shaking up some of the fixities that we have built over time in relationship to Europe's kind of dialectical self-definition with the rest of the world. So I just wondered if you could say more about that interesting um, set of potentialities. Thank you. I, I, you know, I think this was in a way also the, the, the starting point of my mm -hmm. reflection where, where the entire book project really emerged. Uh, the idea namely that we have this very rigid idea of what Europe is when we pitch it against uh, or compare it with, but it's mostly pitching against uh, the, the rest of Europe, right? So there is a kind of um, fluid uh, world that is in transformation that has a lot of potential and there is this kind of old rigid world, uh, well, the, the, the rigid continent of Europe that uh, brought a lot of very bad things upon the world, which is, of course, also it's one of its legacies. And uh, I try to uh, undo that and break that open, really, in my book and to show that if we look at Europe itself, and this is why I brought up the, the, the history of Europe in the second half of the of the 20th century. I mean, Iron Curtain, the Yugoslav Wars, Crimea, um, Ireland, uh, we see how many, how many things that are related to space, to cartography and to geography actually, you know, still impact our thinking of what Europe is. And now in particular, I mean, uh, even before COVID, but the question is really, where are Europe's boundaries mm -hmm. and how 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 do the northern countries respond to you know countries that are perhaps now more in need of financial support in the south or on the the boundaries of europe uh what are the power structures within europe to undo that and to allow uh really some space to think about it that was um what what i had in mind and um i i do not want to venture into into the world uh, if, because I, I don't want to investigate countries and cultures whose language I don't speak. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I want to stay within the bounds of, of Europe and, and to show the complexities as much as I can and precisely the, the kind of, you know, uh, blurred, uh, it's blurred legacy and very complex legacy as it were. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a question uh, from um, one, of our, one of our audience members. Thank you so much for an extraordinary talk and an exciting book. Would you be interested in talking a little about the topographical registers of thinking about Europe? For example, the ways in which um, the ways rivers, coastlines, mountains, and other features serve to shape or deform narratives of continental boundaries? What is the force of topography in world making? Thank you. So uh, actually, Konrad Zeltis is, 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 is one of the humanists who reintroduced the word topography into uh, the, the, the geographic nomenclature of the 16th uh, century. So the, the, the binary term used before topography was reintroduced was the Ptolemaic um, cosmography uh, versus chorography. So the, the global description or the description of the world as opposed to the description of a region. Um, and they are methodologically very different. Um, and topography started being introduced as a third term, really, I think, to break up that dichotomy in a time when continental thinking started to emerge. So it's almost as if there was a need for a third term that became topography um, mm -hmm. to, to, to think about an intermediate entity and an intermediate scale between the regional 
slash local and the global. And um, Sandy is not really very sure about the use of this term. Uh, he uses it very sparingly, but uh, it's a very, it, it, the term made a very interesting uh, return into the nomenclature. And it's, it's, I think, a little bit, you know, disconnected in Renaissance Europe from the use of rivers, really, or natural boundaries. But interestingly, um, for, for Ptolemy, who became you know, one of the central um, authorities on, on geography in the Renaissance period, the boundary between Europe and Asia was the Don River or the Tanais River. Um, and, and in a way uh, that for Celtis, when he describes the confines of and the boundaries of Germany, he has Germany and in a very peculiar way with the Don River. So in a way, there is a kind of very interesting transition between the description of a nation, Germany, and the description of Europe and the, the, the boundaries of Europe. Uh, so it is an attempt also to enlarge Germany and to show that it's actually wider uh, than, that, than it might um, seem. So again, the, <laughs> the rivers uh, are there, but the rivers are normalized. And so what happens, um, after after the introduction of Ptolemy in Europe is that the the the, the rivers which are of course not rectilinear uh, are in a way aligned to fit the map and you see that on the reg regional maps for instance of Germany but not only that rivers become straighter and straighter uh, so there is a, an interesting attempt to uh, think about natural boundaries already through the abstract boundaries when they were introduced by Ptolemy. So I don't know whether I responded to <laughs> that question, I hope. Oh, Laurie, you are, um, you, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> trying not to interfere when you're talking. Um, so again, thank you for this very stimulating talk. Um, can you comment on the relationship, if there is one, between the making of Europe and emerging, uh, emerging processes of racialization? Um, hmm. Well, yes. So uh, there is a wonderful, wonderful article by Ben Brody, Benjamin Brody on the Sons of Noah, and it appeared in the 1990s in the journal of William and Mary. I don't recall the, 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 the year, but it's really a very, um, it's, it's a classical, um, it's a classical, um, a very long article where Brody traces precisely the, the idea of Noah's three sons, and Sam, Ham, and Japheth, and the idea of the emergence of racialization. And I must say that what Brody found, and I'm, I'm not a scholar of race, uh, but what, what I found very compelling, what, uh, what Brody wrote, that the idea of race really came only, emerged really with, with, um, with the later early modernity. 17th century uh, and not really earlier. There is an attempt at uh, dividing up continents according to the three sons of Noah, but they are still very blurred really throughout the Middle Ages. So, and of course, they don't go back to the Bible, um, but they, they, they are still very blurred in the Middle Ages. And, and again, this is something that I haven't really engaged with in the context of continental boundary making in Europe. It would be for a later century. Um, I'm, so I, I think for, for the century that I investigate in, 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 my, in my book, it's perhaps a little too early, but it would be a very, very interesting pathway to, to to pursue, definitely. And I might be entirely wrong. I mean, <laughs> it might it might already happen much earlier, but mm. but it's not something that that I investigated. But I would definitely recommend the 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 article by Ben Brody. Mm. 
as a starter Thank as you. a bibliography also. Thank you very much for that reference. It sounds interesting as well. Um, another question. Um, thank you, Katrina, for, having, uh, for helping to rebuild the borders of our academic world with this online presentation. Uh, the idea of cartographic making is very interesting indeed, helps, helping us to think about the construction of communities. Um, could you say more about the diffusion and the circulation of these cartographies? Which, cart so which cartography? So, so uh, mm. just maps in general or, um, okay, I I'll just say something. Mm. Uh, so, um, so, I'll say something um, that is perhaps less of a cliche, uh, namely Eastern Europe, uh, which is something that is usually um, less less studied. So the Renaissance humanist I, I investigate, Machimir Kovita, uh, who wrote this treatise on the two Sarmatias, he was uh, the greatest map collector in Krakow at around 1500 and he collected maps by traveling to Italy. And uh, he was also, besides being very well connected, he was the king's personal physician. He was also very well connected to the intellectual uh, and scientific um, uh, scene of his time, among others, Copernicus. And it's, and, and what, in, in a way, what I'm trying to do in my book is also to show that not everything happens in Italy and not everyone else is an epigon. So there are very different things happening in different places at the same time and are influencing other people. I mean, let's think about the Copernican revolution, yes? So this is something that happens in Europe's east slash north. Um, and of course, the, 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 the great figure of, of the Copernican Revolution is 100 years later, Galileo Galilei, but there would be no Galileo Galilei without Copernicus. And in a way, this is what I mean when the Iron, the, the Iron Curtain is somehow still present in our minds. A lot of things, uh, be they astronomical or, or mathematical or cartographic, are happening also in Eastern Europe and are circulating very widely. So, my, uh, my Polish humanist, Maciej Kowita, had already a copy of Copernicus's Commentar Jolus in 1514. So there is an entire world to incorporate, I think, into our understanding of the Renaissance world and of the circulation of ideas. So it's not just a few maps or a few big names uh, traveling and, and being read. But um, what I really try to do is to open up uh, Europe to, to other places as well. And of course, I'm not an astronomer. I could never write about Copernicus, really. But I hope to connect some of the, the less studied parts of, the world, of, of Europe uh, and incorporate them into a larger discussion of, of the Renaissance. So this is, of course, only the beginning. But um, I, again, I don't know whether I answered the question, uh, but I tried to just offer one, one idea. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question. Um, I was particularly interested in the relations between cartography and metrics. Could you perhaps explain a bit further why these uses of metrics in Celtis, Fracastro, Fracastoro and elsewhere Mm -hmm. are more uh, mimetically cartographical than, say, merely spatial? That's a very good question. Um, they are cartographic if we think of boundaries and borders as something that pertains both to space and cartography. So I would think that if CETES um, uses spondees to, so it uses two different meters to represent a river um, and uses uh, dactyls to represent the river's uh, rapid flow, for instance. That is perhaps a spatial, a geographic idea. And so we could break that down that way. I'm just, you know, uh, brainstorming right now. And in the second case, when the river takes on the shape, uh, the meter uh, rather, with the river takes on 
the shape of a boundary, then it takes on truly a cartographic, a cartographic function in that it represents a straight line, just like on a, on a Ptolemaic map. And of course, it's very interesting to see also how you know, the, the meter and, and poetics work with or against also the, the text itself, the content of, of, of the text, because then on the one hand, the meter itself draws those boundaries, but then what Zaitis does in the poem is to actually undo those rigid boundaries, as I mentioned before, and to show that Germany actually extends way beyond those boundaries. So uh, there is a very interesting tension between form and content, and not only be, be, between form and content, but also between form content and the, the, um, the woodcuts themselves. And the woodcuts themselves uh, are also very interesting because you can actually see um, that they, on the one hand, show a sort of boundary um, where you think you see um, uh, the, 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 the horizon of the, of, of, of the northern boundary of Germany. But if you look very closely, you actually see that it's the horizon beyond the Baltic Sea and that Germany itself only takes up a third of the woodcut and the rest is the Baltic Sea. So it said it is blurs um, land and water already also on the woodcut. He tricks his readers thinking that actually German extends far into the horizon, far further than it actually does. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, so, so there is also through the addition of those woodcuts an attempt uh, to, to, to be more cartographic. And I should also add that Italian um, poets didn't really use this visual material. So uh, this is really something that is very typical of, of, of Celtis. Uh, he's really a pioneer in adding, in adding a visual material to his to his um, uh, uh, um, to his elegies, so that too makes it much more cartographic than merely spatial. I would argue. We have three more excellent questions, so I think I'm going to stack them since we're um, getting close to the end of our allotted I can, time. I can be faster in my replies. That's that's great, but they're so interesting. You might have to um, <laughs> um, take a, a minute more. Um, okay, the first one is. Um, I was particularly interested in the relation, oh no, sorry, that's the one I just read, sorry. Um, the idea that Eastern and Western Europe are understood to mirror each other is intriguing. I wonder how authors and cartographers handed, handled the presence of the Ottoman Empire in Southeastern Europe. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Second question, could you elaborate further on your decision to employ the term humanism for the book's title and guide us through the implications of that choice across the book's constituent and nationally distinctive chapters? Mm -hmm. And then finally, I have benefited a lot from the book in my study of Lucy and de Manisi on how continental thinking dominates paleoanthropological knowledge production where scientific discourse on human evolution is blended with spatial ideological categories of continental land masses, here Africa, Europe, Asia, Eurasia, and national territory, here Ethiopia and Georgia. Are there works um, on Africa that are somehow similar to your approach? Okay, thank you. Um, so, Ottoman Empire, I'm not... <laughs> You know, I, I wrote a little bit about the, the presence and the importance of the Ottoman Empire in my Portuguese chapter, but really the, 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 the scholar who, wor who works on early modern uh, Mediterranean and also Indian Ocean space is Giancarlo Casale, uh, who wrote an excellent book on the presence of the Ottomans and also the interaction of of, of Christians and Ottomans. And um, I must say that I haven't, I haven't really worked uh, on Southeast Europe. Um, however, um, my colleague Ivan Lupic has just, uh, is working now on a book 
uh, titled The Illyrian Renaissance. So it's really about the Renaissance and the co-presence of, 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 of different cultures and religions in um, South, in the Balkans, in South East Europe, in particular Croatia, hence Illyrian uh, Renaissance. Uh, and I think that might be uh, one, one, one uh, or two really pathways to, to look at. Uh, it's not something that I have been uh, working on, although it's, it's uh, because I can't read those, the sources in, in Ottoman Turkish. I'm, I'm, you know, it's uh, uh, unfortunately uh, maybe a, a next project. But uh, the, the question about humanism, well, I think that the same way I wanted to redirect uh, the word Renaissance Europe, I also wanted to redirect the word humanism. And as I mentioned, if you open the book on Renaissance humanism, space is not really an issue. Um, the, the questions addressed uh, are, you know, philological, linguistic, uh, religious, and I think that space needs to, to, to feature much more uh, uh, in a much more, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say dominant, but in, in a much more forceful uh, way in, 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 in humanist scholarship um, because, because we tend to forget how important it was. So, so this is, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but this is something that, that was really one, one of my major, major concerns. And Africa, I think Alfred Hyatt wrote a book on, on Africa. If I'm not mistaken, I would redirect the person on, on, uh, to, 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 to Alfred Hyatt's book, and I'd be happy to send also a bibliographical uh, reference uh, to that. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, Katrina, for such an excellent um, presentation and the audience for their wonderful questions. And I um, hope to invite you back in the future to talk about your new projects as well. <laughs> but thank you for today and uh, thank you all for joining us and hope to see you back at the center another time. Thank, thank you, you, Katrina. Thank you very much, Laurie. <laughs>